You are listening to Missed Apex Podcast. We live F1. Welcome to Missed Apex Podcast. I'm your host, Richard Spanners Ready. I'm on my own in the shed today, but that doesn't mean there won't be a variety of voices. Our Meet the Panel segment is with the very charismatic and energetic Alex Jeansy Van Jean, so you'll get a chance to get to know him a bit better. We've got Matt Squared, that's Matt Trumpets and Matthew Summerfield, giving us a bit of a tech insight into some of the car launches. And we'll start the show today by catching up with a World Endurance Championship driver and commentator on F1 TV, Alex Brundle. So let's get to that interview right now. My next guest is a British endurance racing star with two visits to the Le Mans 24-hour podium, multiple World Endurance Championship race victories and the 2016 European Le Mans Series Championship to his name. He also enjoys his work as a broadcaster and he's known for his technical insight and world-class single-seater and endurance championship analysis. It is none other than Alex Brundle back in the shed. Uh, Good afternoon, Alex. Oh, good to be back in the shed. What an intro. Yeah, wow, it's thank from you for that. Your website, I just stole it. <laughs> I just <laughs> it's like whoever wrote that must be re- must be really on it, must know exactly what I've been doing over the last well, couple Well, it's a of years. very pro website and I looked at it and I thought, well, it actually sells Alex really well. You've got so many strings to your bow now. I think we should start with Alex Brundle, race car driver. This season's racing is all sorted, ready to go. Yeah, ready to go. I'm, I'm signed for two years now, which is sort of at the level of sports car racing I'm at is 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 cool. It's really nice to have um, for inter Europol competition, who I'm not expecting the the immediate Formula One uh, fan to have heard of. But sure. they're a world endurance championship team, a privateer team racing LMP2 cars. Um, are they plucky you know, underdogs or are you, are, you, are you dominating the series? We were plucky underdogs. We were plucky <sighs> underdogs. And now we're sort of moving into sort of we're in a we're in a kind of 2020 mclaren kind of stage oh, where nice. we were we're we're now getting to that point where the results <laughs> are are going and we need to kind of keep the trajectory and maybe, maybe a bit more like a 2021 McLaren, where we need to kind of keep the trajectory going um and so yeah looking forward to the season uh teammate esteban gutierrez who is right. uh, mercedes uh mercedes um third driver um simulator driver and uh, and test and reserve and uh we we all carry an amateur driver kubish mikowski which i had to spend a long time i'm sure he won't mind me saying i had to spend a long time practicing his name <laughs> uh is our is our third driver he's our silver graded driver um as uh, you'll know in endurance motorsport we have drivers of sort of different gradings and he's a, he's a great guy as well and super focused and on it so i'm looking forward to the season so in Formula One, there's always talk about three car teams and and the way the team structure works and bringing in, say, talented rookie drivers versus quote unquote pay drivers. What what is the system there in the endurance racing that you mentioned, the silver class driver? So messy, wow, messy, messy, and that's a podcast in itself. So I won't go to <laughs> I won't go to, for a, for a very different yeah. audience, but. Um, Broadly speaking, you've got a range of drivers with a range of sort of financial environments. You've got some okay. sponsorship backing. Yep. You've got uh, a little bit of prize money, but not much. And it all sort of comes together in a whole general mishmash. And it's down to the drivers and the teams to make uh, a sequence of races that are A, we get to go racing, B, it hopefully profitable or we get to make a living uh, and see we're competitive as well and so there's no one strategy but it gets done put it that way okay so generally in a team you'll have like the uh, the pro drivers um a connected team driver so you'll have maybe you two like you and esteban and then someone who comes in with some funding but you do you have to have that person and i guess you hope that you've got someone like that that also has some racing skill Exactly that. So that would be the traditional model that you would have, where you would have somebody who wants to go racing, loves their racing, uh, is not a professional race car driver, but has the wherewithal to have that team. And then they may well employ a couple of other drivers uh, to to drive the car 
with them. Um, but as young drivers try to make their way through sports car racing, there's a couple of little angles on that, basically sort of a Formula 2, Formula 3 model, uh, pay to play, pay to make your name uh, kind of environment going on, especially in prototype oh, racing. Oh, I right see. Now. So when I put my son through, I, I pay to give him his shot to, to be Alex Brundle's teammate. And then he impresses and then he gets picked up as a star for LMP1. Exactly. That's, that's so what aim. you've got yeah. are all the feeder series and Formula One all happening at the same time on the same grid <laughs> in sports car terms. Of course, yes. You've got all the different tiers. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, yeah. So it's all, it's all a great big mess of cars and drivers and you've got to try and make sense of it and do a good job. Okay. So I guess the nightmare scenario for you would be someone like me. I have a small amount of cryptocurrency, which I assume will become billions very, very shortly. I turn up at an LM, LMP2 team with uh, limitless funds but i'm 41 and not very good at any form of racing but i've got the money to to get my way in i guess that's the nightmare scenario you don't want a a spanners i mean realistically though the, the drivers are to try to protect the marketplace of sports car racing the drivers are graded in tiers so actually the concept of it is that you as somebody who was racing interested um but of uh, not not insignificant skill i've seen you i've seen you karting oh yeah Um, i didn't want to say i didn't want to be the one (laughs) to say it (laughs) but would be you know who's done racing and and is good at it but maybe not you know spent your whole life grinding away at becoming a little prodigy race car driver um would be racing theoretically against your opposite number in the other team. Oh, I see. Yeah. So, so if think think pro am think pro am golf tournament playing so like, off. Yeah. So, like yeah. Michael Fassbender would be a good example of this in sports car racing. The actor. Exactly. Exactly. And there are you know since Steve McQueen uh, made the movie Le Mans and moved across from acting to pursue his passion in motorsport, there there are a sequence of drivers who uh, uh patrick dempsey was another one a sequence of drivers that have kind of dropped into that mold and they tend to race porsches because porsche's the the brand that is synonymous with it and it's its mm. whole little ecosystem but there there we go that's another podcast <laughs> for you for another is, for another day well i just wonder is there is there anything f1 can can learn from that is it an, a good system or and because what tends to happen is the feeder series it's all very linear you are 12 and then you go up to cars and then you either make it to f1 or you divert off of that that tree whereas you can come into the tree in sports car racing at different levels at, at the moment you know at the most you can have say a pay driver funding a team so that you can have Vettel there or a pay driver funding a team so you can have George Russell there. Is, is there anything more F1 could do? Because we're not going to get rid of wealthy drivers coming into F1, but is there anything we can do to kind of use that to make sure that we've got actual lots of talent on the grid as well? Well, you know, the, the, it has happened, funnily enough, in the past, you know, back more in GP2 level, uh, Formula 2 level, where you'd get a driver, um, you know, like a Pantano or a Liuzzi, or somebody like that who would drop into, or, or a little bit like Sam Bird, I believe, did at Russian time, where they would drop back in to those teams to supply their expertise in terms of setup and actually take one of the cars in a in, a, in an extremely well funded team. I, I the the phrase I use, which is a bit weird, a bit of a weird phrase, is infest the the gaps. The pro drivers in sports car racing, we infest the gaps. We find our little niches you know what i mean and actually you end up being managers as much as anything else because you Uh, know if i want to if i want to go and drive if i want to go and drive an lmp2 car and make a living out of it um and i want also my shot potentially driving a manufacturer car it falls to me to not only jump in the car and do a good job but also often find the amateur driver find potentially a sponsor who might be interested in, in the team, find my co-drivers and put together the jigsaw puzzle. And so actually they're the, they're the oil that sort of greases the wheels of the marketplace. So if they all fell away, then the whole thing would just collapse because there'd be nobody with the motivation and the force to actually make it all happen. Yeah. So like as someone who you know, isn't rich and doesn't come from that, that driver world, I suppose I've got a romantic image in my head where it's 
like a like a football league structure, you know, and and you're picking purely the best drivers, and you've got 26 F1 drivers that all fought their way up through every tier, and and, and I guess at some point you've just got to be realistic that you're describing that that picture where me as my crypto billionaire, I want to drive. It could happen the other way around. I could go and look for a Alex Brundle or a Bradley Philpot to come in and basically. It be be the one to sit in the car and go. No, it's got three wheels. Could you not tell it's got three wheels? Yeah, I mean, the the, the obviously the ideal world is yes, you would have cars that run at zero budget, and then you would have you know leagues, and you would pro- progress through the leagues, and yeah. the, all the best people would be driving the best. Car. I mean, there's there's that would be the absolute optimum, and then you'd just have loads of leagues, and it would fall down, but. You, to do that, you would actually to take that argument through to its um, logical conclusion, which I have done several times with several people. Um, you would have to delete the manufacturers from the sport. That that's where right. that's what it comes to. Because essentially, what you do is you end up with a top level of the sport that doesn't cost any money. So essentially, you end up at Formula One for karting money. Yeah, is that been possible? Am I dreaming? Well, it's it's it, it is possible. It is possible. Um, but How? make it happen. W- You're in charge. Would it be in? Would it be interesting to watch? And would anyone get anything out of it? So, so the problem you've got is that, let's say I'm Mercedes. I want Ooh. to use Formula One to demonstrate my hybrid technologies, my competency, my ability, and I have X to spend on that based around its marketing budget. So I want to do that, which means that I'm prepared to put a certain amount into Formula One in terms of entry fee, in terms of cost and everything like that. And I want to make Formula One what it is. Now, I don't want to let teams race with me uh, and potentially beat me for less than that because I'm Mercedes, Mm. which which then drags the cost if you imagine the cost of motorsport as a sort of a, a, an elastic band, <laughs> yeah. you're just dragging from the top, which means that all of the drivers who might then go and drive for me have to drive a car of a similar level and so on and so forth. So weren't we kind of in that position a little bit in the hybrid era? Because I guess Mercedes had a lot of influence and power and they would keep, I guess, lobbying for rules that allowed them to spend more money to be competitive. Did that happen to some extent? Yeah, of course. Mm. And, and you know, it, it's, the same thing's happened in Formula E. We have, you know, um, teams pulling out of Formula E because their their road car, they felt that their road car technology was more advanced than the technology they were being allowed to demonstrate in their Formula E cars. They wanted to spend more money on it. Mm. And so... Yeah, uh, to get an advantage, uh, to use their advantage. To, to use their mm. advantage and also what's the point? If you're a manufacturer, you've got to go there. You know, they, they've all got to go back to the board at the end of the year and go, well, we've spent X million on motorsport this year. This is what we gained, mm. you know? And so, and so that, that's the problem. Um, so if you want Formula One as it is, as a demonstration of, of incredible speed, incredible technology, incredible everything, um, then you know, that's the, that's the realistic, that's a realistic entity. Okay. Yeah. So I can see from that explanation, actually, that's a really good thought exercise to work through that. So the works teams are the problem. So I hate all the works teams now. Oh, hang on. Nearly all of them are works teams now, essentially. So I guess losing the privateers and having more and more works teams, we were inevitably always going to go down this path. I I don't, and is there any way back? I I think the, you you're always works teams are always going to want to 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 buy an advantage because um and red bull are in a really interesting thought exercise because actually they are not an oem manufacturer but they are allowed to compete and be successful because of the amount of money they're prepared to spend on the sport yeah um i th- i think that, that that's kind of accepted because of the amount of money they prepare to spend on the sport and what a superpower they are in terms of marketing the sport mm. um but it's it's a fundamental. It, it, can you imagine yourself in the the position of running F one? Yes. And you've got these, you know, you've yeah. got Renault, you've got Ferrari, you've got Mercedes, you've got you know Aston Martin, you've got all these teams, uh, you know, with their checkbooks open. It's going to take pretty serious bravery 
to then go, you know what? My F1 car is now a four-speed V8 with no downforce and one set of tires for the weekend. Yeah. And you can all just yeah, go away. And then there's no incentive for any of the teams to do that, to bring their money, to bring their sponsors, uh, to bring their, their effort. Uh, okay. What, it sounds like what you're trying to tell me is running Formula One would be way more complicated than, than I think, which is a bit of a blow. But, and if you were to do a competing series... <laughs> I'm where, sure you could handle it. If you wanted sure to do a single-seater spec series to try and compete against F1, I, I just I don't think there's any room. There wouldn't be any room. I think F1's so ingrained in everyone's minds as the, the prime single-seater series. Oh, how, how do you think a, a competing spec series would do? Let's set it up. Let's, uh, let's do it. Well, there have been them. I mean, you've got A1, A1 you've got GP. A1 GP. In you've like 1972. Come on, how yeah, long ago was that? Yeah, I know, you, you know you've got Super League formula, but the, you've got you know what's called um, what's called first mover advantage, and it's it's incredibly you know yeah. when Formula One pick up the phone to Miami, you know the 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 governing uh, environment and and the governance of Miami, and go hello, we'd like to have a Formula One Grand Prix in Miami because Drive to Survive has been very successful in the US, and we'd mm. like to try and capitalize on this US market. Who called this morning? Formula One. Oh, did they? Okay, great. Yeah. You know, who, who called this morning? Formula Spanners. Who? That's a good... You know what I mean? Well, obviously, series. it would be huge because it's you. It's a good series it's... name. I like it. So they're Facebook. <laughs> they're Facebook, basically. And, you know, yeah, if you try to get through or, you know, with your Vine social network, it, it might not be as ubiquitous. Um, but let's let's focus back on, on you. I want to talk about your F1 TV work. Uh, you Every second I look at F1 TV, it seems like you're more and more entrenched love your analysis on there and your kind of skypad style and analysis on the screens uh, but is it annoying that sam collins is a giant and makes you look <laughs> like you're a normal sized person but he makes you look like a hobbit there's actually a really because they they uh, we made a, a slight error uh, earlier on this year and it was it was carried off with with excellence i don't know if if anybody noticed it they styled it out incredibly well where they actually left our youtube stream on while we were all getting set up oh no and it's and someone clicked it uh clipped it up on on youtube of sam collins doing quite a hilarious impression of me oh no <laughs> i didn't just... see it <laughs> so so if you want to go if you want to go and search and find it. it it's if you want to go and search it yeah it's it's to, to my i mean he's he's a hilarious bloke but it's it's to my great detriment because he's done me beautifully <laughs> um but the the yeah oh look that um up. he i mean just sam and, and and also um and also scarbs uh just the level of yeah. of a the level of interest the level of work but it's not work to them it's not work to them. They just love it. it. It's two guys there that they don't, they don't, they explain something to you because they want you to know it, not because they want you to know that they know it. And does that make sense? Yes. They really, they really want you to understand it. Yeah. To share. And, that, and that's, yeah. And, and that's the great joy of being with them and, 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 and spending time with them is that they're in no way, you know, sometimes you'll talk to a sort of a professional that you might, you know, uh, pay to explain something to you. And they use all those big words that you, you know, Synergy. and what you know they're really trying to do, what you really know they're trying to do is prove to you that you need them. Yeah. The, the absolute opposite of that is that they really want you to understand it. And it's, it's, it's great fun broadcasting with them, honestly. Really. Yeah, and, and I guess you get to spend that much time with Sam that you're just, you're just getting technical knowledge just accidentally falling on you like dandruff and you can just scoop it up and put it in your hair. <laughs> yeah, well, he, he just loves... <laughs> He just loves bits of old, he'll just have a phone full of bits of old race cars. And, you know, you jump on a call with him and he'll just be surrounded. He's got this room. I don't God knows where it is. And he just, he does all his calls from him. He's just surrounded by books. <laughs> like it's pretty, it's pretty cool. But yeah, mm. um, they're, they're happy enough to share with me all, all their knowledge, which is great. I think one thing that is clear with you on F1 TV and listening when you've done the junior series commentary as well, is that you are genuinely enjoying that. That. There's no gun to your head. Uh, is it close to the driving experience? Because it does seem like you're enjoying it almost as much as driving. I, I like to do it. I like to do it. Uh, do I? Do I want to be a race car driver still? Like 
more than anything yes i do i do um I really enjoy um, the bit where I get to try to put people in the car and there's that moment, especially when you explain things to people face to face or, mm. or it, sometimes you see it in the production team where their kind of eyes light up and they go, uh. I never thought about it that way. <laughs> you know, you know what I mean? And, and then that it really fit. You feel seen, man. You feel seen to use a, to, to use a, a 20, a 2021, 20, 2022 vernacular. Um, you, you feel like you've managed to kind of connect, which is kind of cool. I like oh, that. Well, let's connect with our, our patrons who have lined up a series of questions for you. And the first one is race car driver related. It's a great question. It's from Sam Labine. He says, what is it like pressing the brakes on an actual high end race car because it is not what you expect is it for like compared to your road car which goes all floppy and squidgy even in my sim rig here we've got uh what do you call it the load cell pedals so you hit it and it doesn't move people sit in the rig and they go oh your brake's broken it's like, well no it's, it's just meant to be like that but what's yeah. that like at speed the foot thing isn't moving and but yet you're depending on that to stop so you don't die yeah, the reason why they do that is feet are better at judging pressure than angle. So yeah. that's why they that's why they do that and make them really stiff like that. Um, and also, bizarrely, feet are better at judging pressure when they're putting a lot of it on as opposed to when they're just touching. So I guess that's maybe that, that's not bizarre. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the deceleration, first things first, anything with carbon brakes won't stop the first time. And you need to get used to that. That's Won't really weird. stop the first time. What does that mean? No, carbon brakes don't work until they're hot. And oh, when I say I don't work, right, I'm with you. I mean, I mean, really, don't work. I mean, you could brake at triple the normal braking distance, maybe double, two and a half, triple the normal braking distance, and you won't stop. Really? So that, is, that's is that something? Is, is that the same yeah. in F1 cars, F2 cars? Yeah. And yeah, that... well, they're carbon, carbon ceramic, but yes, yes, right. they, I mean, F1, they have uh, heating systems around the, oh. the wheel hub, which help a lot, um, but especially cars which don't have such clever systems. Um, yeah, they, they won't work initially. And then the sensation of, remember that you've got, so when you're trying to turn a race car, you're asking the front wheels to do pretty much all the work. And you're yeah. also asking the tires to do something they don't really like doing, which is working what you call in your, and by your, I mean that. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, for the um, audio listeners, Alex is sort of waving yeah. his hands side to side. Yeah. But you guys know <laughs> so, what so, wheels look like when they turn. Exactly. So, <laughs> so take your car and move it through, move it through plane X kind of uh like <laughs> alex is swiveling his hands like a goose how, how, looking from left yeah. to right <laughs> you know what i mean anyway tires love working tires love working in linear in linear which is a, in a straight line stop go yeah. basically and so you're asking all four tires to do absolutely what they do best with their maximum efficiency all at once which is why the braking g is always so much greater than the cornering G. Almost every every race car will hit its greatest G actually longitudinally uh, on the brakes, and that blows your mind the first time you do you do it. You won't believe how quickly they stop. It's I mean, outrageous. So I mean, with an F one car, they've got like the hands devices to keep the the head from just shooting forward. You've driven a whole range of cars. Has, has there been any neck snappers where you go, actually, I don't fancy doing that again? Yeah, and it's actually put your neck in an incredibly weak position because the front of your neck is quite is quite weak. So you have to you have to, and you know you put people mm. alongside you when you're doing sort of passenger rides yeah. or similar, and and they're the first thing they notice is that their head can't actually stay with the braking G of the car, and they end up looking down <laughs> into the footwell. Um, so um, yeah, a, a lot of it a lot of it is that. Uh, and having the bravery not only to go deep into the braking zone, but also break, hit the brakes with the required force yeah. is something which it, it takes a lot of time I bet. Uh, to develop. Yeah. So uh, every preseason driver training thing, it has two videos of the drivers on Instagram. One is where they've got those rope things and they shake them up yeah. and down. And then the other one is the neck strain exercises. Now, you're, you're a very physically fit guy. You're qu quite bulky, actually, for, for a race driver. Um, but a bit how, bulky at the moment, yeah. Are you? But yeah. deliberately so, we, we hope. Is, yeah. is actually, do you get away with it a bit more in, um, uh, in endurance racing? You can be, carry a bit more muscle. 
Absolutely not. No? Absolutely not. Because oh. our, our weight, our weight is added to the weight of the car. Um, oh, right. it, so there's no, there's no uh, kind of uh, uh, ballasting to the driver's weight because you share the car amongst three drivers. So at the moment, I'm 68 kilos. Oh no! Uh, what <laughs> oh, what a tragedy! Is, yeah. Um, so so as, I, as I <laughs> so I'll get strong. I'll get stronger uh, through sort of December and January, and then as I move in towards the season, then I'll 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 slice down, and I'll, I'll aim to be sort of around sixty three kilos, so I can be sixty five, sixty six with all my kit on uh, when I get going to get to the first race. Oh, okay. Do you, actually, that that goes in. And I know we're covering a lot of uh, endurance stuff, but some people have asked some questions. So at least some people are interested. Um, with the hand signals, though, there's the every, there's a shot yeah. of every race driver doing the bit where they they put both palms flat to demonstrate a racing overtaking scenario. I bet you've got one on your Instagram somewhere. Would racing drivers be able to talk to each other if they weren't allowed to do it's, that? Yeah, it's just pure. <laughs> that's 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 how racing drivers do because we're used to being able. Well, we're used to having no conversation with each other at all we're just staring across at the other guy's cockpit gesticulating yeah so so i, I guess <laughs> that that's how uh, and we also end up spending a lot of time in europe and you know what they're you know the full coffee machine hang signal stuff so, <laughs> so well whilst we're talking about size and weight trucking trevor asks how does sharing a car work when the drivers are all different heights sizes and have different driving styles and preferences do they find a happy medium uh, um, or do they just go with whichever gives the fastest lap time we can definitely bring that into f1 actually and which parts of the setup cannot be changed but with the weight and height stuff do you basically set up for the person with the most money is that how it is that how it works so the bitcoin guy is comfortable the biggest guy the biggest guy, just go which, for the can biggest guy. Bit, which can be the bitcoin guy <laughs> but it can also be the other guys um you know so let's say you've got alex verts in the car uh, uh, you're going to basically, well, he's huge and really, yeah. really tall. Um, so he'll kind of, or, or you have a wide guy and then he'll, he'll make the base seat. And then basically what you do is the smaller guys, you know, you've seen them make seats in formula one. They have that kind of BD stuff. Sure. And then, and then they put the resin in, um, and, and basically the guy sits in it. It just makes an impression of your entire body with his focused butt. on yeah. butt. Yeah. yeah. And so we'll basically make another seat inside the biggest guy's seat. Oh. And that's how we do it. So you just quickly like the big guy jumps out, you pop yours in and then and then you jump in. Yeah. Oh right. Yeah. So how much do you think of a difference it makes for because there's a few tall F drive one drivers knocking about. So you've got George Russell there who had to hop into Lewis Hamilton's car. Like does it? Should we just, just go play basketball, George? Just leave us little guys with our motor racing. So F one is is an even more complex solution because what they'll then what they'll do to take any uh, to take any excess weight out of the car and put all the weight in the right places is they'll make a seat in the same way we do in endurance racing. They'll then scan that and then form fit it as part of the car. So oh. they don't actually even have to put a seat within. It'll just be absolutely perfectly fettled for uh, whichever pilot you need. I don't know whether George had to put a seat in the uh, baseline tub, actually, when he drove in, in Bahrain. Mm. Um, yeah, that's the question. That'd be interesting one to find out. But um, I would imagine they'd get a tub out there for, uh, seat out there for him, sure. Excellent. And uh, Nicodemus, Nicodemus says, we've uh, seen data become an increasing part of commentary and analysis in many sports, F1 included. And uh, we were lucky to have an F1 representative here to talk us through some of the AWS graphics. As a motorsport commentator pundit, I mean, he means you, what sort of data would you like <laughs> to have in order to improve his commentary uh, and 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 by extension, the viewer experience? Thanks for, for that, Nick. Yeah, interesting. What, what, is, there any, is there anything, when, do you think we're missing as viewers? That, well, if only we could see the pedal inputs, for example. I mean... Oh... For me, I can from from the the media and technical center at Formula One, I can see more or less everything. I mean, more or less. Uh, uh, what what I don't get are uh, are brake traces unless I ask for specific ones, and that's because the team all have the teams all have clever yeah. brake by wire systems, and they don't want us to see the traces. Um, I think it's going to be incredibly interesting this year because obviously you've got a lot of technological differences between the cars and the way that they're going to come out of the box is going to be uh, vastly different 
what do I what do I think we're missing uh, in Formula One? Or what's important? I, I, yeah, yeah. I think average stint times and the progression of and the progression of timing is something which is often foregone for a kind of uh, for a kind of very subjective sense of how the tires are. You know what I mean? So there, there are numbers for that. You can look at that. And when you look at those projections of laps, the lap times as they fall away and the sector times as they fall away, yeah. you can actually deduce the further sector times and so on and so forth. Whereas just a camera looking at the tires showing they have blisters on doesn't really actually tell us much because they could all be blistered, you know, or, or so on and so forth. So I think more timing data would be great. Watching using the F1 live timing app during races has just revolutionized my viewing experience. Because, like you say, you watch those sector times coming in and you can see things like cars going off a cliff, uh, or you can go, Oh, wow, he's actually been holding that exact same lap time. He must be aiming for that. And you can kind of get more strategy out of it. Uh, whereas, unless the commentators are specifically looking at that, you, you kind of miss it. But I guess you've got all that information in front of you to, to utilize to communicate to us. I mean, it, yes, exactly. And it's our job to communicate that. Uh, it's, it's it's a real shame that viewers, the majority of viewers aren't looking at that because from a professional perspective, what some Formula One drivers do in terms of management of the tyre over a race distance, when you see their lap times, you know, when you look in practice yeah. and you look at the, the, the Friday practice analysis of the tyre falling away, and how quickly it falls away. And then you see the engineering work that goes on, and then the guy will put 38, 40 laps on that tire. Mm. And you'll just think, you know, from having, from having tried to do that, even with a tire which is set up for endurance racing, you just think, how, mm. how have they achieved that? And it's a real shame, you know, you try to convey that, but until you're looking at the numbers, and watching the cars at the same time, you don't really get that sensation. Okay, here's a scenario that is often hard to read as a viewer: is stint one. They all they get, you do lap one. You all shuffle into your position. Uh, a little bit tricky to overtake. How can you tell? And can you tell from your position with your data which cars are are pushing very hard, which cars are tire saving, which cars are stalking? Because you know very often you see the the tactic of say Lewis Hamilton who likes to stalk, 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 then suddenly appro- applies pressure when he thinks he's got an advantage on the tire wear, and he used to just skin Bottas on that race after race in stint one. Is that the sort of thing that's easier to see from your position? Yeah, you, you can see it, and and there are a couple of things you look for. I, I get people ask me a lot you know, how you discern understeer and oversteer Ooh. from sitting in in the commentary box. Yes, tell um, us those things. Okay. <laughs> well, it, it's it's something that once you, once you felt it, I mean, first of all, you can tell when tires are being managed, there are two main points. Firstly, you're going to look at the positivity of throttle application. So, Ooh. you know, you listen for it, listen for it. Um, when a drive, when you hear the driver go, bah, maybe with a bit of, maybe with a tiny bit of oversteer in the car and you hear the throttle come in positively, yeah. then you know that there's no saving going on. When, when you hear the big weight, wait till the car's straight and then the throttle comes in gently. That's when you know there's a bit of saving. Oh. Um, the, the front tire slip angle. So basically compare the steering wheel angle. Yeah. With the angle that the car is traveling. Gotcha. Car is actually traveling. Okay. Yeah. The bigger the slip is, the less tire saving oh, is going. Is that what slip angle means? Oh, I've heard that phrase so many times. Right. Brilliant. So if you're looking at a driver and he's got his steering wheel all the way cranked over, but the car is. And the car is yeah. not turning, okay. but he's still in the throttle, then that means he's. He, and, and so then you can start to discern when they're going to pit. Because what drivers will do is they will manage the tire, manage the tire, manage the tire, manage the tire. Then they'll get a radio message through and you'll get the, okay, give it all you've got or hammer time or whatever it is they, they want to say. And then you'll see them do that. And then oh, it's like, okay. right, well, he's coming in this lap. So, so if we're pushing, we don't mind generating, just getting to the point where the understeer is starting to come in because we're, we're, we're pushing to that point. And then we don't mind wiggling the back end uh, as we get going flat binary on the throttle. 
so it builds temperature in the tire and the, the Pirelli tires, because of various reasons of the ways they're constructed, which just literally the tire is a machine that gets built. It's mm. not just, you know, people think of tires of like <laughs> yeah, a, yeah, sort yeah. Of a balloon yeah. made of rubber, but it's not, there's oh. all sorts of stuff in them. There's, there's steel, there's Kevlar, there's other bits Skittles, of stuff holding yeah. them up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, there's a little, you know, elves within <laughs> helping the, no, <laughs> there's all sorts of things, you know, um, uh, and because the, of the way the Pirelli tires are constructed, they're very thermally sensitive. It's one of the things which they're trying to fix for this year. And so sliding the tire even slightly sideways across the road will make it lose quite a lot of grip quite quickly. They're not happy to do that and, and also lose a lot of grip and therefore wear its surface faster. And heat it as well, yeah. And, and heat it. Yeah. And So when they don't need them anymore, you know, two that laps to go to the pit, Boom. There okay. we go. All right. That's the rest of them. So you know? I'm, I'm finally an F1 driver. I've been told to save my tires. So when I go into a corner, I'm going to I'm going to just I'm going to wait just that little bit and, and, and take that bit more speed off so that I've got less slip angle. So it's going where I point it. I'm, I'm presumably I have to have a slower corner speed to make that happen. Then I have to be yeah. a bit more patient on the steering. Wait till my steering's a bit straighter on exit and be smoother with the, 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 thro the throttle on exit. How much am I losing? when I do that in my F1 car? So there's a style to this. Um, and remember, I said to you that tyres really like to work in longitudinally, line, yeah. forward, forwards and backwards. So there are a couple of things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to, and, and I'm not going to damage, unless I lock it up, yeah. I'm not going to damage my tyres longitudinally. You can't break so hard you wear your tyres out. And you can't accelerate you know, it, so hard that you can burn them out? You can you can if you get wheel spin, and and especially if okay. you get what's called traction issues with lat with lateral load, which are basically sliding sideways while you get wheel spin. They hate <laughs> okay. that. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so what I'm going to do is brake really late, and in a very straight line. Oh, okay. Right. So I've I've one time on the way in. Yeah. Right. Then I'm going to turn. I'm going to find a slow speed, quite a slow speed, turn. Without slip yep. in the steering wheel. Then I'm going to open my hands once I've got my turning done, get the car really straight, and then accelerate what is quite hard out, but with the car extremely straight so I don't get wheel spin. Uh, okay. So that yeah. is a race style which keeps the car out of the areas of its traction circle that damage the tyre. Oh, okay. So just like they do in the karting instructional videos, do all your braking in a straight line and wait till you're under control before you accelerate. Can can you... So you're minimising time loss. I assume it's not possible to do that and be at the ultimate pace. Otherwise, everyone would just do that. Exactly. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. So, so, so the optimum way is obviously the, the traditional race line, which... You know, let's say I'm, I'm going to drive the car in qualifying now. I'm going to go into the corner very, very deep. I'm going to crank the steering lock on, get the car to bite into the tarmac, generate a load of heat, turn, mash the throttle down, <laughs> use just, all the nice... And just deal with the meat. oversteer, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Use all the nice meat in those rear <laughs> tyres and slar them all over the road as I, as I kind of semi-oversteer my way out. That's the optimum fastest way to deliver a qualifying lap. But they just won't do that lap after lap after lap. Ah, I see. So when we look at drivers like Lewis Hamilton and Sergio Perez, who have a reputation for being kind to their tyres, do they maybe naturally have a style that's more like what we've described? No, or they adapt to it? Entirely technical and learned. Right. So there are there are in my in my opinion, mm -hmm. um, I'll, there I'll are take also your opinion, Alex. <laughs> yeah. So there are also settings, you know, to go along with that. So you might need. Uh, the diff the diff open a little bit to allow the car to rotate a bit more in the mid corner uh to to allow the car to rotate all at once at a slower speed um or you know you might need a little bit more diff locking through the exit to protect the rear tire in the traction zone yeah. and so when we talk about drivers being incredibly technically eloquent as we often say, you know, about, yeah, Checo or, or Lewis Hamilton or, you know, or, or whoever. That is what I mean. So they're able to take the scenario, they're able to adjust their driving style, but also adjust the car around them to optimize that driving style, which is how, you know, when you look at, when you watch 
you know, and, and you think, how has Lewis Hamilton kept that hard, set of hard tyres alive for 46 laps? It's through all of these marginal gains everywhere. Oh, so when you had drivers like Mark Webber and Kimi Raikkonen, who people say never adjusted to the Pirelli tyres, could that be part of the reason? Yes. So, uh, yes, I believe so. Mm. And also because of Pirelli tyre, uh, traditionally, you see them when they're, you know, when they're sliding across the road and you get those lovely sl- yeah, slow motion shots. They look really cool, they? And they and the the tire oscillates. Yeah, going backwards and forwards. You see them yeah. sort of bouncing, bouncing, bouncing across the racetrack. I'm sure you can picture it. Yeah. Um, that is because the tire has quite a soft sidewall, um, and that's the way that they're and that's the way that they're put together. Um, and that takes a very specific driving style. You have to be quite patient in the way that you apply load to the car. And you have to wait for the car to roll and load up the sidewall. And that just doesn't suit some drivers, including me when I first arrived in, in, in GP3 and drove on the Pirelli tires. And when I've driven them in, in Blanc Pan and, and that, uh, that kind of thing, um, drivers that demand uh, immediate response from the tyre don't get on as well with, with the Pirellis. Oh. That, that is really interesting. I've just realised how much the clock has gone on, Alex. So I want to get through a few more questions if you've got a little bit more time here uh, with us. James has uh, asked a very similar question, actually. Um, having seen Alonso's comments about needing feel from the steering wheel weight mid-corner to drive at his best, I would love to know more about the approaches, of, uh, bet- about the differences in driving steel- style between some of the top guys and how might they might approach a corner or a lap in different ways. Now, I would have thought that the steering wheel weight, is that adjustable? Can you adjust the feel in a Formula One car? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, you've got power steering, um, oh. so you could just turn it off a bit. I mean, fundamentally, oh, okay. but then there's, 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 mm. there are a couple of settings you can use. There's a setting called caster, which is where it, it, if you imagine the 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 mechanical way the car turns now imagine the front wheels turning but as they turn they also lift the car oh, okay. off the floor you're pushing the the front tire into the floor as it turns okay that is that is that is that this, is cast. this is an episode where you need to t- tune into the youtube version if you're just a podcast yeah, yeah. listener that was quite a dance there okay so yeah, yeah. so as, as as the car's lifting and dancing and kind of biting the outside tire I guess for more grip on the Into outside. The road. Yeah. Yes. Um, so that naturally will make the steering wheel heavier. Heavy, yeah. um, and the more you can load the contact patch, the more it'll the more it'll deliver grip. Uh, you know, I, I wonder if Alonso there is actually reacting to his original days at Renault, where they had the where they had the weight distribution very far back. And he actually, you know, there's that qualifying lap from uh, Barcelona that did the rounds a fair a fair time back, and it was reminded when he had a run uh, around Abu Dhabi in it earlier mm. on. Um, was it last year? Um, that, oh yes, yeah, yeah. yeah before, basically, yeah, so, yeah. he really used to sort of the steering was super light on it because all the weight was was over the was over the rear <laughs> axle. I wonder if yeah. it's just a reaction to that. Oh, okay. That is that's interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. Sort of reminds us a little bit of sim racing, where you can choose the stiffness. That's the only thing I can compare it to. Uh, but certainly, if you make it too light, you just you lose all the feel and the response. If you make it too heavy, you're having to like wrestle a goat to the ground. What about what about yourself in an endurance car? Where you're having to share it with three guys. You can't adjust the wheel weight between stints, presumably. Oh, you, you can. can. You oh. can adjust it. Yeah, adjust it between corners if you want. So I mean, so we obviously have um, full full electric power steering. So I will often throughout a race weekend because I'm hideously lazy. Uh, if we go under safety car, I will uh, I'll turn the power steering oh. right up. <laughs> okay. To to, to, chill to weave. So, to so, weave and chill a bit. So uh, Bradley Philpot has uh, tested F3 cars. Uh, you w- were driving in. F GP two wasn't it? Was the last class you drove in GP two? GP three. GP three. GP three of, of single seaters. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I, I was driving in his his sim pod, and uh, I, I had a go in it, and I and then he jumped in, and he went, "Oh, you've got the steering the." the power cranked way down with the wheel weight. And I thought, oh, blimey, that's heavy already. So he cranks it up to where he felt it should be in the F3 car. And when I jumped back in, I felt like I needed to go on a SAS course. to, to Like the, the weight and the power needed is quite surprising. And do you think it's like that in F1? Is there a similar 
weight wheel weight or are they cranking it down so obviously when you when you jump there will be a certain element of feel but when you jump from f2 which obviously has no power steering you're literally turning a rod which turns a mechanism which you know yeah. has two steering rods out to the front tires and those turn that's that's how that's how you turn you know a, a formula two car uh, to Formula One, where you've got power assisted steering, where there's a box which will literally help you uh, to, 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 to turn the steering wheel. Um, I, there's obviously a big difference. But what I would say is trying to explain the physicality of driving one of those high powered junior series cars. I mean, you're talking, I, you're talking until unless you've trained for it yeah. not being able to turn the fast corners yeah it's it's it it's weight training stuff it's proper you know it's it's a gym it's a gym session oh, every wait, lap is, is, a gym is session. that why the drivers do that rope thing where they beat the ropes uh, up and down <laughs> is that <laughs> yeah definitely i mean yeah. it, i believe i believe that actually you know in modern times of a formula two race round, they all talk about monaco as as being incredibly physical um and and the rest of the formula two season as well but i think you know that they are supremely physical things to 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 get around a racetrack um formula renault the proper formula renault 3.5s were notorious everybody used to buy new gloves every oh, really? second weekend because uh. it would the force and torque of the steering wheel would tear through their race gloves um <laughs> such was the such was the force of it yeah, and but yes, I, I would imagine that Formula One, it would probably be dangerous with the weight of the cars to have it so heavy and unmanageable. I, I would guess if you tried to do that, you just no, wouldn't bother. Yeah, if you tried yeah, to do you that, just... you wouldn't be able to put a human in without any power steering in an F1 car with the weight and, mm. and forces involved. Even in a sports car, even in a sports car, you you would you wouldn't you can't turn them. They're set up in such a way where if the power steering fails, you're going straight. Okay, doesn't here, matter. It's here's one. one. Um, yeah. I think it was. Suzuka 130R, Charles Leclerc, and he had to adjust his wing mirror or hold it or something, and he ended up doing 130R one-handed, or it could have been Blanchimont in, in Spa, I can't remember, one of those. And people go, right, these modern F1 cars, they're too easy. If he can drive it with one hand, I'm like, yeah, he can, because he's been through all the junior series. You can't, Derek. Sit down. <laughs> the, thing, the thing is, it, it completely changes, and it's... It's one of those things that the physicality of, of driving a car like that, which is a lot like driving a, a top class sports car, um, but obviously with a, with another step of intensity, it's more like a, you'd have to be fit to be a sort of a fighter pilot or something right. like that, um, where it actually tires you from within. Imagine, imagine having a force on your whole body. It, it's, it's literally gravity sideways. <laughs> it's gravity sideways times four, you know, and it's a force which acts on every single part of your body. You're trying to stabilize it. Your your body is unable to stabilize it. And literally you just flop into the side of the race car, which is which is is yep. is the in which direction the force is acting well i feel very silly because even like in a rental go-kart uh, outdoors pathetic. i get i get thrown pathetic. around inside the seat and I go oh blow me i could i don't think i could be a real race driver makes me glad that i just talk in a shed for a living i think uh, alex brundle i think we'll leave it there thank you so much for your time uh, good luck uh, commentating and doing your f1 tv stuff and, and please say that you're not uh, too famous and busy with f1 tv to come and occasionally pop in the shed and speak to us I'm I am I'm definitely not fake. I'm reasonably busy, but I'm definitely not famous, mate. So um I, I'm more than happy to come and chat to you. 30 seconds. Tell everyone why they should go uh, go and check out uh, Alex Brundle behind the wheel. Oh uh yes, cool. Check me out on socials and check out uh the YouTube channel, which is full of racing things. So if you like racing, it's a good place to go for that. But you, you did up a Mustang. That's your latest video series, isn't it? I'm, do, I'm, do, I'm doing up a Mustang slowly. <laughs> I'm building one slowly. And then I was skidding one about. There's lots of V8s on it. Just enjoy it. Uh, it's, it's just funny, funny bits of cars and uh, sliding around. So it should be a laugh, really. To follow that and all of Alex uh, Brundle's social media, just check out the show notes below. Mr. Brundle, uh, we will see you. Have a great season. Thanks a lot, Spanos. It's good to see you.
Brilliant. Always great to have Alex in the shed. Hopefully we'll hear from him later on in the season. Now, recently there has been some car launches and some of them have been more whelming than others. And so Matthew Summerfield is going to give us a bit of an insight into what he is looking for when he sees these tech launches. I believe this was just before the Aston Martin launch. So up until that point, they'd only seen a render of the Haas and the kind of show car from Red Bull painted in the 2022 livery. So from my point of view, the whole point of that was to show off a new sponsor. Uh, Maybe it's the same for some of the other teams as well. But he's going to give us some insight into what to look for in these launches and what life's like, I guess, for a tech journalist uh, during these launches. Please do hang around for Alex Van Jean in the Meet the Panel segment. I believe the tech segment is about 25 minutes. So please do enjoy that. We've got Matt Trumpets and Matthew Summerfield with you right now. Once again, we're fortunate enough to be joined by the hardest working man in Tech F1, Matthew Summerfield, a.k.a. Summers F1, assistant technical editor at motorsport.com, who has deigned to sit down and share some wisdom with us. It's good to see you again. Thanks for taking the time. Yeah, no problem, Matt. And to be honest, this is the busiest time of the year for me, as you can appreciate. Car launch is imminent and obviously testing just over the horizon. So, you know, a a very, very busy period. Yeah. And that's why we super appreciate it. And you mentioned car launches and boy, by time this gets heard, there will have been more than a few. And so what I was really hoping you might be willing to do today is not our usual game of find the most minute thing and talk about it for hours, but instead to focus in on some of the larger things that our listeners and viewers can pay attention to with the new cars now i know they're just renders yeah yeah i mean that that, that's the thing with these car launches and especially for 2022 a lot of the teams are probably going to be trying to hide as much of the detail as they possibly can right up until that last moment Um, as much as obviously we know that uh, the first test is obviously not going to be broadcast as we've had over the previous few years as well so that does mean that there is going to be a little bit more secrecy in that respect and i don't think that we're really going to see the the real deal uh, of many of these cars until right to the last very moment um i think there's there's going to be a lot of detail that's hidden by the teams as we we go through this launch season yeah and it's especially easy to do when they're computer generated you can just not fill in certain details or borrow something from last season but even with all that There's got to be some big areas. Now, like for me, for example, I'm not the most visually acute person. You show me 10 brand new Formula One cars and I'm like, oh, look at that. A whole bunch of cars. And, you know, do you know that game? uh, Find the difference. My answer was always, well, one's on one page. One is on the other page. So for someone like me, where should I direct my attention to see some of the places where the teams will be doing them, where the biggest differences between the teams will be? Okay, so obviously, first of all, the the new cars this year are going to be very visually different to what we've had over the course of the last probably 20 years, if not further. You know, everything's changing about this particular type of car. Um, First off, you've got things like the front wheel weight deflectors. That'll be something that people will notice. Now, they're more or less a spec design, so there's not too much that the teams can do in that respect, but it is something to be aware of. Um, On the front wing and the nose, uh, the designs have been constrained heavily compared to the previous iteration of cars in order that the objectives of this particular regulation set, which is to try to improve uh, racing and keep, you know, make it easier for, for the, the cars to overtake one another. Uh, that objective is easier for, the, for, for them to meet. So things like the nose uh, will be very similar amongst the grid, but there is still some diversity in the way that those designs will, will come out uh, as we'll see with the front wing. Uh, maximum amount of flaps on the front wing you will see this year is four which is down from five last year. Uh, And there is obviously the option to run uh, three uh, flaps as well. So you will see some differences in terms of the designs of the front wing. 
In terms of the front wing and its interaction with the nose, that will be quite important as well because some teams will opt for a longer nose, whereas some will have a shorter nose. Uh, some will connect to the front element of the front wing, whereas some will sit back from there. And obviously, all of these sort of design decisions are very crucial in the way in which that everything from an airflow point of view then moves downstream to the rest of the car. Now, the most important thing about this particular generation of car is how it makes its downforce. So obviously in years gone by, we, we've been used to the sort of um, a different type of design. Now we're going back to a, a sort of underfloor generation of cars. I don't want to call them ground effect cars because I think that's a bit of a misnomer. Uh, we, we're using Venturi tunnels um, and we've still got a, a large diffuser at the rear of the car. In fact, a much larger diffuser than we've had over the course of the last few years. Uh, and that's where they're looking to generate most of the downforce is on the underside, on the underfloor, rather than using, you know, trick ways of making downforce from the body of the car itself. Uh, obviously, there's been a, a major switch towards the aesthetic side of things as well. So this car is, has got some very different cues in terms of the aesthetics, like the front and rear wings. And I think that's crucial to know. And that obviously will ha dictate how the teams design their cars as well. Uh, some of them are obviously not happy about those sort of things because it takes away some of their design freedom. But, you know, they have to cater to those things. Okay, well, let's focus in on, on the front wing and the nose real quick, because we have seen at least one render already, Haas. Now they've already said, oh, this is like, you know, Derek the intern did that for us when we were just first getting started, so don't make too much out of it. But I did notice that as far as the wing and the nose goes, one of the things that struck me compared to the FIA car was how different and, and where, like, do you remember when, was it Alpha that came out with the different front wing shape? To everybody else, the the lower the, loaded uh, wash wing, the outwash wing, are could we potentially see something like that between the different teams, or is it too soon to be looking there? There will be some diversity amongst the way that the teams have approached things, but because of how strict the regulations are in regards to the design of the nose, the length of the nose, the, there's a, there's a lot of um, check marks that the teams have to make. Um, under this new current set of regulations, they have to, you know, follow certain demands that the FIA have set out in terms of the actual design and the way that things meet with the front wing. But there is still some scope for us to see diversity, um, but not a huge amount. You know, don't go expecting um, every single one of the, the you know, the, the designs to be incrementally different to the, to the next one um there will be differences but you know the the scope to which they've been able to make those changes has been reined in a little bit by the by the governing body okay um so let's talk about one of the things that i read about that sort of interested me was how the cars are a bit shorter this season but there's still some variability but it's all apparently in the front of the car couple of things there maximum wheelbase for this season and onwards will be 3.6 meters and that is kind of within the realms of where we've been with other cars throughout the course of the last sort of five years uh, mercedes are slightly longer than that they were probably around about 3.7 meters in wheelbase so when we're talking wheelbase i just mention this because it might be something that confuses people wheelbase is between the axle lines so between the front and rear wheels you'll still ha have the overhang front and behind the car as well so that the cars are much longer than 3.6 meters probably about 4.5 meters in total um off the top of my head um but yeah you you the, the maximum is 3.6 and so a lot of the teams will probably push right up to that measurement. Now, Red Bull, I think we're about 3,550 at last year. So they were close to the maximum that we would currently have this year anyway. So obviously there is going to be some advantages and disadvantages to uh, the, the actual wheelbase itself. But on top of that, I think one of the measurements that you have to really consider is the axle line at the front. Um, so the front wheel axle line can only be 
be, well, it can, it can be a hundred millimeters back from AI, which is the front of the chassis. So you can have some variance between the teams, and most of them will probably try to push that as far forward as possible, so that the tire wake uh, doesn't get ingested by the underfloor. But there's obviously going to be variation in that respect because each team will make their, their own decisions about what they're doing to connect the front airflow to this midsection. So there will be some variability there. Uh, and obviously we'll see that throughout the course of these launch renders. Okay, well, let's move backwards a little bit because one of the things that struck me when I looked at the Haas render was the side pod and the side pod inlet. Is that another place where teams might decide to do some very different things? Most certainly. I think that's probably the area of the car that people will be able to see the most variation in. Uh, and the reason for that is the way in which the volumes are used um, and the surface reference points are used to be able to dictate the, the, the shape and the position of the side pods and the side pod inlets. Um, if you're not quite au okay fait with what would be living within the side pod you would normally have the radiators you would have electronics you would have intercoolers and those are things that need to be fed cool air in order for them to operate at their their right temperatures and so you want to obviously get a, a very good clean flow into the side pod inlet now the Haas render showed a very strange um, side pod volume because we have a very narrow inlet that then balloons out to a very wide side pod. So it actually balloons out to the maximum width that, that the side pod can possibly be. Uh, and then obviously you get this sort of crafted shape back in towards the Coke bottle. All of those are dictated by you know the, the regulations themselves. But I do think that we will see variation in that respect because if you look at that versus the FOM model, the FOM model had a very high-waisted uh, side pod all the way to the rear of the car. Now, obviously, the Haas one had what we would consider to be very similar to the, the side pods that we've had over the last few years that taper down very quickly to the floor in order to help aerodynamically. So there's going to be, in that area, teams are going to make some pretty different designs in order to meet their objectives, keep the power unit cool and all of the ancillaries and the electronics that are housed within the side pod. Um, and as I say, I think you'll just see a great variation amongst the grid in, in the way that they approach that from all the different angles that the side pods create in terms of aero cooling and so on and so forth. Okay. Well, I know that one of the things that you have written about is one of the things that we are actually going to be missing, which is the barge boards, which had become sort of a major development area. How, how is that being transformed to work with the 2022 car? If I wanted to talk about it vaguely, intelligently, what has happened to them and what has roughly taken their place? Okay, so the barge boards have been discarded entirely. We don't have them anymore. They were a very powerful aerodynamic tool uh, that helped the teams to make the floor work and make the side pod undercut and the floor work and all sorts of things were, were working from the barge boards. What they also helped with was the front tire wake. Now, with the new regulations, we've got the 18-inch wheels, which means that uh, the tire squirt issues that we had in the past are lessened. So, you know, the, the bulbous sidewall in the tires don't move around as much which means you don't have uh, as, as much of a problem there and on top of that you've got things like the skirts that run along the bottom edge of the front tire to help deflect that wake outwards and then we've got the um, fences underneath the front edge of the floor and we've got the floor edge wing as well now we can have up to three fences inside and under the floor and we can have one edge wing and they'll all have different designs based on how the teams want to work the airflow in that area uh, so we we'll probably see teams taking a look at what other people have done uh, and trying to scrabble to 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 make improvements on their own cars as they, they kind of work out what might what what might work best for them as we go forward throughout the course of these regulations Okay, well, if we move back just a little bit further, one of the things that I noticed a lot of people talking about and saying when they were discussing these regulations were the following two words, beam wing. And apparently it's an old thing, but it's coming back. What is it? How does it work? And, and um, will we be seeing a lot of differences between how the teams use that space? 
Okay, so the beam wing effectively is a winged section at the bottom of the wing. Um, we call it the beam wing because it runs out from the crash structure out to the rear wing end plates. Now, when it previously existed within the regulations, which was back in 2013 and beyond, um, it, we had end plates that would meet with the floor. We don't have that in 2022. So the beam wing actually has a, a quite a structural effect on the, the design of the wing itself, uh, along with the swan neck pillars that will support the wing uh, from um, a vertical aspect. Uh, the beam wing, or should I say beam wings, because that's the one thing that I think has perhaps gone a bit away from people's minds with the Hass render, because you only see uh, one element with the Hass render. They've decided that that's what they're, they're gonna do with that particular version of the car, whether that's how it actually turns out, we will see when uh, we get to testing, etc. cetera. Uh, but you can actually have two, 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 two sections, um, two airfoils in that section, uh, as long as you don't impede the, the, the center line exhaust. And uh, obviously that will give some variation in terms of design as well, depending on how the teams decide to go, whether they go for one or two elements. Okay, and apropos of absolutely nothing whatsoever, I don't suppose there is a load test for these beam wings to see how flexible they might be in an airstream. There, I don't believe there actually is a um, <laughs> oh, deflection FIA. test. Will you certainly ever learn a, your lesson? <laughs> certainly not a direct def deflection test. I'd have to check, actually, Matt, to be perfectly honest. It's one thing I haven't looked at, um, but I, I don't think there would actually be a, a direct um, influence for a deflection test over the beam wings now okay all right uh, to, to be fair is it's not like i gave you any it's wording in the notes it literally came to me while you were talking um one visual thing that i remember learning about that made me so excited uh back when i saw the 1991 ferrari in the museum of modern art was i was able to tell the difference between push rod and pull rod suspension now there's no guarantee that any team will have one or the other but why are we talking about pull rod suspension again? What has changed in the design of the car to make that happen? And if I needed to identify itself, what's an easy way to do it? And, and do you think, I mean, because Haas did show a push rod suspension, but everyone's been saying Ferrari's got a pull rod suspension because it's like junior high school time of year and technical F1. Everyone's got rumors, but no one has facts. What do you think is going on there? Okay, so to answer firstly, pull rod versus push rod, there isn't a great deal of difference in terms of how they would operate from a mechanical aspect. What you would use a different the, the two differences for is depending on uh, the where you're sighting them. Uh, so at the front of the car, because everything for this particular set of regulations is much lower in the nose cone and chassis, it does sort of edge towards people heading towards the pull rod because then you can lower the centre of gravity because all of the equipment that uh, is taken up with the pull rod would then be lower in the chassis. So so there are some advantages in terms of, of, of weight. Um, also, aerodynamically, there, there's some differences because of the way that you position, um, you know, the, the, the suspension elements themselves. And obviously, when we're talking about the way that airflow flows through the front section of the car, I'll get to the rear in a moment. Uh, but when we're talking about through the front section of the car, you know, we've got a very important section this year with the Venturi tunnels. And then above it, you know, with the restrictions that are in place with the side pods that we've already talked about and all the variations that we might see in those designs, it might be important for them to go down a, diff a certain route to be able to get the maximum amount of performance uh, from their particular design. So, yet yeah, the rumours that are circulating is that uh, McLaren certainly seem to have uh, a pull rod design based on uh, a certain Zach Brown's um, phone during a fire up video, and uh, then there is a rumor that that uh, that Ferrari will also pick up on the pull rod at the front as well. But the Haas, as you mentioned, the render did show a push rod. However, it was just a render, so there can be some misdirection in that respect. However, what I would like to just throw out there is the possibility that we've gone through a, over a decade's worth of racing using the pull rod for rear suspension. Uh, and this was because of an idea that was sort of brought back by Red Bull. 
Uh, the RB5 in 2009 was the first car for a very long time to use a pull rod at the rear of the car. And the reason for that was because the rules or the prevailing regulations suited having a pull rod layout. And they did get caught with their pants down a little bit because of the double diffuser and the way that, that the two things interacted with one another. However, it was the way to go. And since then, every car on the grid has moved towards pull rod. However, with the new regulations in place and having a much larger diffuser volume at the rear of the car, there could be argued that some teams might re-look at going down the push rod route at the rear of the car. So we could sort of see this, this flip over in respect of suspension design. We could see pull rod at the front and push rod at the rear. Equally, we could still see what we've had over the course of the last few years. It's all a bit of speculation at the moment, but the, the design options are available to all of the teams to try to exploit to their, their, their best attempt. Okay, so I've been ignoring it up until now, but we've got different wheels. They're spec wheels, and a lot of things that we've grown accustomed to in Formula One, uh, the complicated ducting, the surface shapes to help transfer temperatures into the tire bulk, they're all going to go away. How are the new wheels going to work? How are the wheel covers going to work? And why has the FIA not mandated that everyone run the LED wheel covers? I would like to know this. <laughs> okay, so firstly, we obviously we're moving to 18-inch wheels, which are all supplied by, by BBS. Uh, this rules out uh, any intricate designs like we've seen over the course of the last few years where teams have used fins and knurling and all sorts of intricate designs to their real, wheel rims in order to manage heat transfer between the tyre and the wheel rim, uh, which obviously then has a net benefit in terms of performance. On top of that, we have a situation where the uh, technical working group have decided that they want to try to manage the amount of airflow that is throughput through the wheel and out through the side of the car to reduce you know, the sort of aerodynamic impact that can be generated. So we've got uh, a much larger wheel well, we must remember that. So we're going from an 18 inch wheel to a th from a 13 inch wheel to an 18 inch wheel. So we've got a, a larger well, which means we will have larger brake ducts in in many respects. Um, some teams might shrink them down to accommodate a, a different uh, thought on that, but we'll see uh, as soon as they start taking their wheels off the cars in testing. And what will happen is that we'll have smaller inlets to take cool air in because now they won't be putting air out of the assembly to you know to, to the outside of the car they'll only be cooling the brakes so you don't need these large air scoops that we've seen over the course of the last few years because they're only cooling brakes they're not having an aerodynamic impact as well but also we will also see a rearward outlet on the in, inboard element of the brake duct as well because you can't you can't send that airflow outboard uh, moving on to your um, wheel covers, the reason that uh, the FIA haven't mandated the LED ones is I don't believe they're actually ready. Uh, they're not. They're not actually going to be fit for purpose straight out the blocks, uh, and that means that there's actually two designs available. As you've mentioned, there's the LED ones, which um, will serve a certain type of purpose to add information for spectators. Um, but you've also got the more flush covers as well. So I, I think we might move to the LED ones once the, the technology advances a little bit and, and everybody's got on board with, with exactly how they work and what can be done with them. Okay, so before we wrap this up, is there anything that I have not yet brought up that you feel like people should know as they start to look at these renders of the cars? Is there any, any other area that you wish to get to um, before we say goodbye? One last thing, DRS. Because I keep seeing people assuming that DRS is not going to be part of the 2022 car. And that is probably because Formula One management have done a poor job of representing that fact because their show car and their renders didn't show the DRS um, actuator pod uh, and you know the the movable elements and the Haas render also had that missing as well and so that just really added to the speculation that that DRS wasn't available. It is available 
uh, the, the, it will be on the car. Um, the, the flap, the top flap will be 960 millimeters wide. So not as wide as the wing. And that is because of the shape of the end plates. Uh, and, and for those that are confused about how the DRS flap can possibly work with this new volute shaped end plate, and basically just think about the central section of the flap being opened. That, that's all you have to think about. It's still very much the same. It will operate in exactly the same manner. Um, and the teams have to take that into consideration when they're designing their rear wings as well. That, that has, to be, uh, has to be said. All right. Well, thank you so much, Summers, for coming and spending a little time and helping to educate uh, me and our listeners about about everything we're going to be looking at and and trying to understand, or I guess some of us will be trying to understand some people. It's okay. If it's not your thing, I'm just saying that right now. But before we go, where can we find you on the socials? Where should we look for you? And I do want to say, if you want to know a lot more about this, like about the brakes that I didn't talk about and all this other suspension elements that are changing, go read Summers at motorsport.com because he's done some excellent articles about all of these things. Thanks, Matt. And yeah, the best place to find me is on Twitter. It's Summers F1. Uh, and uh, I, I ramble on there about both Formula One and on occasionally my golfing life. Lovely. Well, Let's head back to Spanners in a Shed, and thanks again for taking the time to speak with us. Thanks very much, Matt. I listened to all of that, and you had my full attention the entire time. Excellent. Uh, that just about wraps up the F1 content for this week. Thank you for staying with us. Please do support our efforts and encourage us to do this kind of thing by going to patreon.com forward slash missed apex. We're going to end the show with what has proved to be a, a pretty popular ending segment for the off season content, which is our meet the panel. I absolutely love these guys and I want you to get to know them as well. This week it is one of the most charismatic but frustrating and just friendly and warm generous people on the panel is yes that's a lot of adjectives but he's a lot of things so here it's time to meet the next member of the panel <laughs> introducing alex jeansy van jean hello jeansy thanks for joining me in the shed Hi, Spanners. Thanks for having me in the shed I'm, on my own. Yeah, just you, focusing in on you so I can be super nosy. I think the first thing that we need to acknowledge is that you are a dad of two absolutely impossibly cute little girls, but they are, they're the worst age at the moment. So like you're yep. in the worst bit of parenting. I'm in the bit, bit of parenting where I want to stay up late because they suck all my time, and then I'm up too late, go to bed, don't have enough sleep because they're in my bedroom at half past five in the morning. Yeah, and you're the classic example of me upsetting everyone's better halves and spouses. <laughs> so, yeah, so when yeah, I say much. with the kind permission of our better halves, it applies to, to you and Mrs. Van Jean a lot because you set up like a giant green screen in the middle of the living room and you've got little children who've got to shuffle off to bed. So like, I do appreciate the sacrifice that the Van Jean house goes through to get you on the panel. Yeah, I don't bother with the green screen anymore. I just make sure I tidy the lounge up. Um, but uh, yeah, the 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 kind permission of a better half is definitely something that works well. Lauren's Lauren's really good. She she um, she understands that this is something that we do and something we enjoy, um, and it's a passion of mine. And you know, she's a good supportive wife. And we support each other's passions, which is what it's all about. Um, I remember once I did have to cancel the show just before we went live because one of the kids wouldn't go to bed and they were screaming while I was trying to get ready and set up for the film. And it just wasn't going to happen. Well, it, so yeah, but it, once I get my office, it'll all be sorted. And this is the same boat I was in when my children were the same terrible age as your kids. We were already <laughs> starting to do F1 podcasting and my studio was in the spare room underneath their bedroom. So I would get yelled at constantly, keep it down. I'm like, I can't. I'm yelling hysterically at the microphone. <laughs> uh, so, yes, it can be very difficult to juggle. But you've you've had uh, the children the entire time, I think, that you've been on our little Missed Apex journey with us. When did you start? 2017? No, I think it was 2015 because I, 
unlike most people, heard about Missed Apex through Dad Hub, which was the show <laughs> that that um, you and um, Matt, Matt used to do <laughs> about parents. That I, when I was frantically looking around for people who were similar who had children um when when phoebe was born in 2015 so and then i got in contact because you guys had great technical info but knew nothing about racing cars that's true we didn't know anything about <laughs> racing cars and actually uh, you brought in a couple of the the panel so you were friends with brad and kyle through yep. karting and that really kind of gave us a backbone of just ground level racing knowledge because you guys you know you've done a lot of uh, rental karting together like the british rental kart championships and stuff yeah, well, I, I literally met Brad at a random night at Daytona Milton Keynes about 11, 12 years ago. Um, and then through BRKC, which me and Brad kind of started together, and then Brad went off and went his own with it, met met Kyle through it. And, you know, Brad's, Brad and Kyle are two of my best mates. Did he? Did Brad steal uh, the British Rental Car Championship or could you just not be bothered anymore? Well, as we know, Brad's <laughs> not the – is fiscally challenged – and uh, when I keep telling him to not spend money on things and he wanted to uh, spend money on things that we didn't have, he was like, do you know, what? I'm just going to do this on my own. I'm like, OK, fine. In Brad's defence, <laughs> in Brad's defence, it's a really slick affair and with loads of stuff oh, going brilliant. on, but it's super expensive as well. To be fair, it was it's actually a cornerstone of mine and Brad's friendship in a way, because um, I could have easily have taken offence to that and never spoken to him again. But it was a case of I understood Brad, and it was like, no, nah, it's cool. You, 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 you take it. I'm here to support you. You need me. I'm here. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you guys came along. I have to say, for people who who, who don't know you, you have a very infectious personality. In that, and I mean it in a good way and a bad way. So you have, <laughs> in a good way, in that you are you are instantly likable, but then you you appear suddenly, and everyone's story of how are you friends with Van Jean is, well. I don't really know. He just sort of appeared suddenly and now he's here a lot. <laughs> yeah, it was. Well, that's the thing. I remember listening to the show and I, I really enjoyed the content. And obviously 2015 was quite early on in Missed Apex. And it was a case of everything was really on point, but you were missing things on the on the actual driving side of things just because none yeah. of you had any experience in it. And you had um, a couple of people on the show who who knew who I was anyway. So when I sent a message in and you probably went, who's this chump messaging the show, <laughs> yeah. you know, telling us how to drive. And then someone said, oh, yeah, so he's a pretty good car. No, but it's, it's um, true. I th- I honestly think, I know people get angry at us when we talk about racing scenarios or karting scenarios, but it really, I mean, the fundamentals are stop pedal, go pedal, steering left and right and how to race around other people. And as a lifelong motorsport fan, and I'm the sort of person who would win the work karting do if you went karting with work or a stag do i would win those but then i'm driving with you guys and you actually like laughing out loud to my face at my (laughs) lack of racecraft which was incredible but but also very helpful and enriching i remember the first time we went karting i literally pushed you around the circuit you got very angry at me for that (laughs) it's not Um, a non-contact sport it says so in the briefing video it says (laughs) um but it's quite funny people have a go and say, oh, karting and eye racing. But it does because the fundamentals of driving, of racing wheel to wheel are the same. It doesn't matter what car you're driving. You make a move up the inside around the outside. You leave space. Depends who you are. You leave space um, and you don't smash into each other. It's the same process. It doesn't matter how fast you're going or what the formula is. The, the, the actual formula to creating an overtake is the same no matter what you do. Yeah, it's in, and it's really interesting. Like one of the first times we went karting, I, I was joking about battling you guys. And I, well, I can't remember if it was you or Brad who said, whatever you try to do, we will literally be past you in two corners. Just because your understanding <laughs> and placement of where I'm going to go and where you want to be. was, and it, and it did work out like that. Even when there was... even when. You've uh, been catching me slowly, and I've been trying to like defend or whatever, looking over my shoulder. As soon as you decide to go, you guys seem to be past because you've just got that core racing experience from doing championships. Well, yeah, it's a confidence thing as well, but also when you're when you have somebody infamous coming behind you, you your style of driving changes whether you like it or not, unless you are also one of the infamous people. So the likes of 
yourselves or some of the uh, or some of the listeners that come along the, the they see the me or carters, yeah. the corporate guys <laughs> they see me or brad in our own kit or kyle in our own kit coming up behind you go, oh god they're gonna get past me they're gonna get past me how do i stop them oh they're already past me yes yeah, it's, um, it's already happened it happened immediately so much of it is analysis from the per- from from my point of view is when i'm catching the person that i want to overtake i'm watching them i'm you know the track is just muscle memory I'm watching them at what they're doing and seeing where they're fast and where they're slow, because then when you get there, you know how to set them up and how to pass them. Okay, so before people get too annoyed, us talking about karting, but this is <laughs> this is a meet the panel episode, so it's about you and uh, and racing and karting and sim racing is in your heart and in your blood. One thing I remember from your advice, I do listen occasionally. You yeah, do. You irk me, you so I respond with "Shut up, Alex." But actually, I'm, <laughs> I'm listening. Um, is making it happen is overtaking proactively. And one of the things watching you karting and sim racing is you so often take the very first opportunity. Whether the person in front knows that was the first opportunity or not is a different matter. It, it depends if I rating is on the line or not. Yeah. Um, I'm funny enough because in, in officials I'm relatively passive, but if I'm this in sim racing one now, of our yeah. sessions and. I want to get past somebody. I will go for it because also you kind of have to catch people unaware as well, yeah. because if you catch them unaware, they're less likely to come back at you. But if you're having a duel over multiple laps, you then figure out where the person is going to try exactly. and pass you. So you then set them up to get them back yeah. depending on yeah, whether you, you, you can, can you not. can have a long opportunity to say, and certainly at our level, uh, with karting and sim racing, you have a long opportunity to go, actually, I'm better out of that one corner. So that's, I can relax on that corner. Mm. Whereas you don't give me the chance to to figure any of that out and you just kind of uh, go for it. Never waste an opportunity. Um, has led to a bit of contact in your karting career though, hasn't no. it, Alex? You no, a few I, I, people. I, I, I've never had contact in a go-kart ever. You're denying everything. Okay. Well, the <laughs> next to meet the panel is Kyle. So we'll get the, we'll get the truth of that. I've actually never hit Kyle. That's because he avoids you because he knows you. I've never hit Kyle, <laughs> um, funnily enough. Not in a car, at least, anyway. Um, I hit... did give him his first VR rollover. Nice. So. Yeah, that's a that's a, a chuck-up experience for sure. But let's get to the <laughs> podcast side of things. When you first came onto uh, the podcast, I noticed that you had a, a very different relationship with F1 fandom than I have. And actually, that was mainly through f- being your friend on Facebook. And I... And I, be- I believe I muted your account, not because of you, but because of the kind of crowd of people you ran with and your friends. And there was really passionate F1 chat. But most of your friends hate Lewis Hamilton. So whilst you have a, a reputation for being the ham on the podcast, I think you come from an environment where you're like the lone defender of Lewis. I think it's why I'm, I, I, it's part of the reason I'm more passionate about my fandom with Lewis, because I've spent the last part of how many years he's been in F1 now, 14 years, whatever it is, defending him. Um, Because I've got a lot of people who just think he's just had the best opportunities, haven't paid much attention to his junior career. And I've had to kind of spend my life arguing and reassuring. (laughs) And the thing is, is a lot of my friends are racing people. So people I've carted with. So, you know, it's they understand the racing side of things. So sometimes that baffles me in the sense of, well, how can you not see it? Um, but I think the general consensus, everyone thinks he's talented, but not as good as everybody says. He's a great he driver. Just don't like his personality. He's not Michael Schumacher. Yeah. So, but actually I saw that evolve, <laughs> not just on your Facebook page, but like everywhere when it came to Hamilton, who is divisive. And some people who weren't his fans end up getting pushed as they argue with people like you pushed more and more to the extreme where by the end of it you know he's a tax dodging you know he's like the 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 focus of all their frustrations and rage almost um so yeah so contextualizing van jeans ham in that context i think is useful for people to listen to here but like you're not even that bad i think you are you do just like have a passionate support and you're used to fighting that corner and a lot of it is tongue in cheek, especially when I go <laughs> over the top. A lot of it is with a smile on my face, knowing that I might be pushing someone's buttons or just winding Last people up week, a little bit. Last week, you called Mac, all Max Verstappen fans glory hunters. <laughs> and I just put my head in my hands going, ah, oh, you're not the one who deals with the YouTube comments. But I know you didn't, I know you were employing her verbally. No, I, I was a Man United fan, so I know about being a glory hunter. Um, but no, it, it's, 
there's seems to be what I meant by that comment is there seems to be an influx of people who've turned up in Formula One yeah. since Max has started winning. Um, and, you know, that's kind of the definition of a glory hunter. But I think there's just as many Lewis Hamilton fans that you could put into that category, Absolutely. Schumacher fans, exactly. And whoever is the, the next big thing to, to come along. And I, I reckon there's probably a, a bubbling under of of Lando people as well who have kind of got an interest in it but if Lando Norris suddenly is in a world title fight watch the swarm of support it will be very Hamilton Verstappen-esque mm. I think that support oh, but it, it's like in tennis you know I'm not a big tennis fan but I do like to watch tennis um, and I'm a Federer fan and I'd never heard of him before he started winning stuff Yeah, you know it, it's that case of all of a sudden this guy's in the limelight oh actually I quite like this guy I'll start following him. Speaking of being a winner, I want to talk about your professional life, if that's okay. You are a salesman, and you, you de definitely have the patter. If you spend 10 minutes with you in a bar, and then you say, oh, by the way, I'm a professional salesman, th th no, there won't be any gasps of horror. No one will be like, oh, no, 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 no. But you know, like my, my dad was in sales. I, I saw sales as a way to kind of rescue my failed launch into humanness. Uh, like 17, 18, and I found I just couldn't do it. There's this barrier, there's an awkwardness that is that I think the people who have the talent for sales, I don't want to say are psychopaths, but I think are <laughs> but I think are psychopaths. It it's that ability to be able to talk to anybody about anything anywhere. Um and I've never really had that issue. I come from a family of salespeople. My mum and my sister were estate agents. My dad oh, has done all right. sorts of different sales jobs his entire life. My brother's still a sales director. Um, my job's less salesy these days. Still at core, it's sales, but I'm more, more key accounts and look after big accounts now. Yeah, you're old now. Um, but because uh, I do with New Build, but I'm not going to get into that because that's boring. But um, And I always wanted it. You know, I, I had the opportunity to go to university. Um, you know, my, my grandpa... God rest him was a um was was a barrister and he had really? money and he, yeah, yeah and he offered you know he he offered to send me to university and pay for it oh wow and and all I would have done would have been a business course and partied a lot and I probably would have got kicked out because I'm not the most studious person in the world and I just thought you know what I can go and follow the sales side because it's what I wanted to do and be further ahead of a lot of my friends who went to uni. And be earning decent money by the time they all get out of uni and have uni and have loads of job experience behind me. And the only people that would, you know, instantly soar ahead of me on a salary basis is people who want to be doctors and lawyers and things like that. Yeah. So okay. It it worked it worked for me. Um, well, the thing that would put know, me off, or the thing that kind of did put me off when I tried anything like that, was the constant interaction with with people. And there's a certain energy. <laughs> <laughs> talking to random people that's not your thing <laughs> it's different it's this is completely different because i am when when i'm presenting even when it's in person i know what i'm 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 giving off or maybe it is similar i don't know but with you to make a a deal happen you've got to get everybody kind of in that in the right place i guess that's your job is mentally get everyone in the right place to take Psychology. to take action and you you have to kind of reset and restart that every single time. At least if people come and see Missed Apex, I don't have to reset spanners every single time. There's a baseline. They know me a bit. With, with sales, you have to go in there every time and just create an energy in a room. And I just I don't know how you guys do it. It's not lots of cold stuff. So with everything I've done, it's mostly relationship based. So it's just yeah. building a relationship with people based on something we've all got in similar. I mean, when I first started doing sales, everyone would just want to talk about football. And I knew nothing about football at the time. And I became a fan of football for work. And then I ended up loving football for 10 years until I got really bored of it. And F1 took over my life. Um, but, um, and it was just finding uh, cues from people on what they're interested in and what they like. It's why since COVID hit, I don't really like doing Zoom meetings with new clients because 
it's very very difficult especially with you know they don't have setups like me and you do where you've got a decent yeah microphone, you're looking up everyone's camera, nose where we're, yeah. where we're, we're looking at saturation of you know before we come on here we're looking at the saturation of the and camera, me worrying so about good. how awful and sweaty i look <laughs> after a very pathetic jog um and it's very difficult to judge from people how they're feeling about the particular thing you're talking about. So we've got a new product that we're talking about. If they're not interested in that, if I'm eye to eye with them, I can see they're not interested and I can change that and I can move, but Mm. I can't do that as well through a zoom call. So I'm much better face to face, but for me, it's all about relationships. So you are very tactile. So you and me meeting up in real life is awkward because you you are just obsessed. You want lots of your skin to touch lots of my I'm skin. A hugger. Yeah, you just want to press yourself against me and mush our hands together. And I can't stand that. I think there's a secret like thing when you handshake someone. That's part of the sales patter as well. Funny enough, the handshake thing is very interesting. So I thought since COVID, I'd never shake anybody's hand again, but it does happen. It's either, it's either a handshake or a fist bump these days mm. um, now. But I was having this conversation with a colleague the other day, which is I now lead, I now don't lead. So if a customer is coming towards me and if they reach out to either shake my hand or fist bump, um, I I react to them. It ends up becoming a really awkward um, game of rock, paper, scissors. Just if I did scissors, I think it'd be weird. Yeah, but it's always been like that, that interaction. Like I'm, I'm so glad not to do handshakes now. And, and I carry, you know, the little, the little sanitizer. So I'll shake hands with someone if they shake hands and then immediately get the sanitizer out. I'm not even embarrassed about it. I'll just be like, uh, no, no offense. You just might have, you know, you might have the, the plague. That's all. Uh, but how do you feel about constantly having to lie to everyone all the time? See, it's really funny. Lots of salespeople, mostly estate agents and car salesmen, have the whole thing of sleazy salesperson yeah, who lies that's about That's you, everything. that is. Um, and it's not. Not for me, at least anyway. I, <laughs> Listen, I, he's lying to you now. He's lying to you now. The, I can't sell that way for one really big reason. I'm a rubbish liar. Oh, so he would say if that. I lie to you, and especially when I'm dealing with customers on a regular basis, if I lie to them, I'll forget the lies I tell and then you get yourself in trouble. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just brutally honest now. Um, and it does help me because if I mess up, I tell them I mess up and then I fix the problem, um, which builds you actually more respect than if you fob them off for a week um, to try and figure out what's actually happened and then get it solved. You, It, it just gives a, it opens you up a little bit. Mm. You have to open yourself up to these people. You know, There's a lot of salespeople who are quite closed off, don't let people in, and that doesn't work for me. I have to let people know who Alex is and, and, and befriend them in a way. It's the same reason I don't have affairs. It's just because I, I, I would never be able to keep up with the lies. <laughs> who has the time? Yeah. it's just... Seriously. I mean, that's, that's serious time management. My wife doesn't love it when I tell everyone my fidelity is more a logistics issue than, uh, than <laughs> anything else. Uh, but, you know, it, there might be a lot of truth in it. My current wife. <laughs> <laughs> um, Alex, it's not the best intro. You are going to be joining us and everyone will get to see the video afterwards at Ella Park this April. So uh, we're going to be doing some, some karting and I think you and me are in the same boat. The The second the date was announced, both of us hit the road and the gym, which is why I'm really sweaty on this video. Yeah, um, COVID wasn't good to me. Me neither, sir. <laughs> um, really, really wasn't. Literally, I think when I got furloughed, I was furloughed for three months. I'm like, oh, we can have a three month holiday to chill out and just eat what I want. And then three months became two years and yeah. I didn't stop but eating. You, but, but you have a genuine like love of food, like a genuine culinary passion. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I, I enjoy the food I eat. I cook a lot. So I like to make nice things. I enjoy sweet things. I have a wife who bakes. You oh, know, nice. it's um, me and you try to powder protein yeah I'm, shake. I'm still on it i still have two of fuel, those fuel thing because yeah. because i i couldn't do it purely yeah. because that wasn't enough to sustain me it didn't taste nice enough no. that i wanted to drink it but um, I, I don't need so, the taste i just need to stop feeling hungry and it did that for me whereas for you that was yeah. not enough yeah no it wasn't enough so <laughs> you know i've 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 gone to i've gone to an extreme length because i've joined a group of basically 30 plus fat people um <laughs> who all want to lose weight wait, wait a minute and it's really good wait a minute 30 fat people or fat people who are 30 plus fat people who are 30 not plus. a group of 37 fat people no okay. you've got to have a particularly high bmi and right. we've all got a particularly high bmi <laughs> and it's actually really great because it's not like weight watchers or one of those things where you've got to count 
different sins and whatever um because i've done all that and it's rubbish um this is just a case of they give you food education on labels and stuff like that on how to eat healthy and you follow and you just take a food diary i've gone to the extent of counting calories and because it works for me because i need a regime yeah um and i'm trying to go to the gym and i'm trying to trying to build up the muscles i I think uh, you might be similar to me in that uh i will i will suddenly realize i'm overweight have like a, a battle with it for several months, get to where I'm happy, live what I think is a completely normal <laughs> life. And then I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm fat again. What, how did that? And then I have to just keep going. But because of carting, yes. And through carting, through carting and then not carting and then carting and then not carting, my weight has literally just yo yeah. And, and, and when the, and these down. missed apex carting events could be responsible for me not being obese because every time a date comes up, I'm like, <gasps> The lap time starts in the kitchen. So I'm really looking forward to seeing you guys again. It's going to be it's two years, I think, over two years since we last did Karting on Track together. So I'm looking forward to that. Your um, birthday at Daytona. Oh, yes. That's right. My 40th. We did. And I when beat you. When you, when, you cri- when you cried on camera and we gave you all the presents. I be- And then I beat you and then you <laughs> cried in your helmet. Valtteri Bottas. Uh, <laughs> What's the Valtteri Bottas? What's that? Which was... I, I felt like Max Verstappen, you felt like Bottas. You had the faster car, like, and I was the better oh, driver. Oh, here we it. go. There's no proof my car was better. But Alex Van Gene, <laughs> thank you. I could talk to you for, for hours. You uh, you are <laughs> nothing if not uh, articulate and, and chatty. And I suggest if you have a chance to corner Alex in a bar at a karting event, you do so. Alex Van Gene, thank you for letting us meet the panel. Thank you. And that's all we've got time for this week. We will be back next Sunday with a live stream with Matthew Carter. And we're also looking to hook back up with Uncle Joe. Joe Sayward will be dropping back into the shed at some point before the start of the new season. But honestly, there's not much off-season left. It really has flown by. By the time we caught our breath after Abu Dhabi, all of a sudden cars were starting to leave garages on filming days. So I'm starting to get ramped up for the new season. I hope you are too even if you're one of those waiting for answers. I class myself among them. So please do follow the show at Missed Apex F1 on Twitter. We've got a Facebook page and you can also follow me, Spanners Ready, on Instagram and also on the Twitter also. Good. Until we see you next time, work hard, be kind and have fun. This was Missed Apex Podcast. Podcast.